Hi there. <clears throat> uh, welcome to this talk uh, called Narnia and the North, Race, Faith and Childhood in 20th Century Fantasy. Um, now I'll be talking about namely race, identity and Islamophobia in the Narnia books, but uh, would also branch out into other texts, including Harry Potter and Disney princess films on, on, the, on occasion. So for those of you that don't know me already or are watching from um, elsewhere, uh, my name is Trey and I'm a Midlands based writer, educator, a poet and spoken word artist and also an event creator uh, uh, based um, in the UK. Um, doing more talks like this, but also I'm more known for spoken word poetry events. So under um, Can You Poet, I go into institutions, deliver sessions much like this one, um, I've done it for schools, universities, non-profits, charities, prisons, and many more as well. Um, you can find out more about what I do um, and my work on my on my website, so treyventor.com, as it says there. Um, the, the last event of this nature was on the 8th of March 2021. It was recorded, however, um, I elected to upload a small literature review instead, um, as and you'll see it um, on the screen um, there. Um, a literature review based on those, for those that could not make it. So a small overview of some of the text that I used to talk about um, race and um, the in race whiteness and the English literature canon. So a 20 minute video or so, rather than uh, what was two hours and 15 minutes, two hours, 10 minutes or so le lecture. So I'm trying to, uh, so I'm still trying to decide what to do with that full recording. So bear with me with that. The next um, Can You Poet Spoken Word event is on the 29th of, 29th of June, which seeks to explore the identities, history and heritage, and really all things South Asian through the voices from the very diverse South Asian diaspora. So South Asian poets or poets that identify as South Asian writing about these things, poets that are from the UK themselves, but also poets that are directly from that part of the world as well. However, I'm also a master's student doing um, my, um, a postgraduate degree in race education and decolonial thought. I'm currently doing my dissertation looking at British race relations in 1919, a year where there are race riots across many UK cities um, following the First World War where black soldiers came back to settle in the imperial mother country. Um, today I'll be in my capacity as an educator, or now I'll be in my capacity as an uh, educator, and this talk was based on an essay I wrote for my, for my masters. Um, the original essay was called "Oh No, the, Sa the Sacred Texts." The Sacred Texts, um, Lewis of Arabia, and the Orientalism that keeps on giving. But today I've slightly adapted that essay to slides to give it a more public appeal. So, the glossary of terms. I would recommend just taking a picture of this slide because I'll be referring to a few of the terms that are on this slide. And throughout the presentation. Fantasy and the world of make-believe are staples of childhood. For children and young people, fiction is a sacred space where they can find answers and closure for many of life's questions. Yet this is also where authors have historically presented their own ideologies, sometimes as uncontested facts. In this session, um, I hope to discuss The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, prim primarily the Horse and His Boy as a childhood text through the lens of Edward Said's Orientalism, popularised in his book of the same name. However, I would like to argue that Orientalism did not go far enough. Limited to the intersecting Islamic, um, so limited to the intersecting Islamic, Asian and also Arabic diasporas, the arguments uh, made by Edward Said can also be applied to the post-colonial legacies in the Black Atlantic. In the same decade Said's text was published, Grenadian politician Bernard Cord releases pamphlet on how the British school system makes West Indian children educationally subnormal. In chapter five, Bernard Cord arrives at the conclusion that the school system ingrains black children with low self-esteem enforced through things like a white middle-class curriculum. Whilst Orientalism can be applied to the horse and his boy, 
and how diasporic African and Asian Muslim children self-identify. The same colonisation also occurred in non-Islamic parts of the Black Atlantic, influencing how black children may identify. Moreover, Orientalism is not without its critics. Um, Warak uh, argued that Edward Said's text levies unfair attack on the West. His text seeks to correct Said's assessment of Western intellectualism, including those arguments about how Western nations are to blame for how the East is seen by the world. Edward Said makes arguments that, does not, that do not leave any recommendations. But how could he make recommendations? He is not the all-seeing oracle. Not too dissimilar to how many I found to expect black people to have solutions to ending systemic racism in our institutions post, uh, post the murder of George Floyd. Briscoe takes uh, 2007 argued that, um, takes this, takes what, Ori takes what Edward Said said and critiques Orientalism with the intention of providing answers to the questions Said raised. In comparison, uh, Warak reminds readers of Western virtues, with both texts diminishing the relevance of Orientalism and thus the theoretical framework of post-colonialism in, in the 21st century and to us in 2021. In its infancy, Orientalism was a form of othering that contrasts Eastern Arabic cultures, so the Orient, in the Global South, to white European cultures in the global north, so the Occidental, where the former is laden with harmful stereotypes. In texts like The Horse and His Boy, this, depicted, this is depicted to children through an east-west divide with the lands of Kalorman and Narnia as stand-ins. And, and I quote here, and now, O oh my host, said the Tarkhan, I have a mind to buy that boy of yours. O oh my master, replied the fisherman, and Shasta knew by the wheedling tone, the greedy look that was probably coming into his face as he said it, what price would induce your servant, though, though he is to sell into, sla into slavery, his only child and his own flesh. And this is directly from The Horse and His Boy uh, by C.S. Lewis. The Horse and His Boy is the fifth book released in the, in the Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, but it's the third book in the Narnia chronology taking place during the rule of the Pevensey children in Narnia. It takes place in Kalorman and Arkenland, neighbouring countries um, south, south of Narnia. So the events in this story happen before the Pevensey children go back to their own world. So after the, after the final battle for Narnia in the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, but before they go hunting for the white stag at the end of the books and film and slash TV series. Our introduction to the Kalorman is through enslavement. This continues with the Tarkhan, so the Tarkhan being um, um, that term that is used in the book to describe a nobleman, declaring that the boy in question is no son of yours, so yours meaning Ashish, for your cheek is as dark as mine, but the boy, Shasta, is fair and white, like the accursed but beautiful barbarians who inhabit the remote north. From, from the start, Lewis's young audience are introduced to enslaved children at the hands of the Kalorman, negative tropes being associated with dark-skinned peoples in proximity to the white Narnians. The story follows Shasta, a white boy, kidnapped as a baby and sold in the land of Kalorman. Whilst he's in discussion with a Narnian horse, so a talking Narnian horse called Bree, the reader is then witness to Brie proclaiming, Oh, the sweet air of Narnia, an hour's life there is better than a thousand years in Kalorman. As children are sold, a story grounded in Western conceptions of the other, East and West, Black and White, North and South. So by that binary thinking. Texts like Horse only reinforce only reinforced the entrenched British xenophobia of the 1950s, where so many children's books, sorry, so many children's authors, fantasy and no, not, reproduced white supremacy, including, including most famously Enid Blyton. Um, Enid Blyton, specifically um, Noddy, comes to mind. As childhood is depicted as the institutional framework that splits children from adults, our introduction to Shasta as an enslaved boy 
intrudes on this idea. Here we are witness to a business transaction, capitalism, flesh for cash, Shasta as a commodity in a children's novel. At its nucleus, Kalorman enslavement, like the transatlantic slave trade, is an economic system. In chapter one through Shasta and enslavement, the author allows adulthood and childhood to converge. However, universal ideas of childhood can differ between various cultures. Shasta in Kalorman is through an orientalist lens of childhood via Lewis's white gaze. Paul Ford writes that C.S. Lewis was a man of his time and socio-economic class. Like many Englishmen of his era, Lewis was unconsciously but regrettably unsympathetic to things and people Middle Eastern. Thus, he sometimes engages in contrasting things Narnian and things Kalorman. He intends this in a broadly comic way. Almost vaudevillian, vaudevillian. but in our post-September 11th uh, 2001 world, he would, I'm sure, want to reconsider this sensitivity. Despite all intentions behind the heroic demeanour of the horse and his boy, there is an orientalist reading worthy of note. Lewis orientalises Kalorman in writing the people as exotic with dark skinned men in long dirty robes and wooden shoes turned up at the toe and turbans on their heads and beards. The repetition of the blessing, may he live forever, is sometimes is, is similar to um, the blessing, peace be upon him, in the context of Islam's Prophet Muhammad. According, according to Downing, According to Downing um, and his book, um, Into the Wardrobe, where Andrew Blake states, Lewis's Clormans are an unkind parody of Arabs, and the Narnia books contribute to the contemporary demonization of Islam. Post Lee Rigby, young Muslims reading books like Horse may begin to question their identity, since Islamophobia is rooted in racism and is a type of racism that targets expressions of Muslimness or perceived Muslimness. As schools today um, may show enthusiasm to decolonizing curricula and represent students in course content, representing students in course content, educators may want to teach more stories that self-represent ethnically diverse cohorts. Whilst today there are more works that self-represent the horse and his boy is indicative of a time in which whiteness and patriarchy committed an intellectual violence of the Occident through European fantasies of the Muslim diaspora and its relevant cultures, its intersecting cultures as well. In movements to empower young girls or young Muslim girls as well, so the intersections there, characters like Arabist Tarkina, so Tarkina being meaning um, noble woman. Um, Arabic, like, characters like Aravis Tarkina are damaging to how Muslim girls may self-identify. With her introduction by escaping a forced marriage, still today parents, teachers and other authoritative bodies are still focused on Muslim representation of forced marriage and other forms of patriarchal gender control. If educators want to sensitively teach these texts to children, post-colonial critiques of 20th century fantasy is one way to do that, whilst also mitigating the emotional impact that inevitably will occur when black and brown students and staff engage with the racist and prejudiced illustrations and lexicography of the last century. Following the 11th of September 2001 attacks, how claims one passage in the last battle gains renewed currency. In the finale to the Narnia series, the land that generations of children had grown to love was demolished by an enemy, the Kalorman, who are very uncomfortable, uncomfortably written through a white colonised gaze of the Middle East. Whilst horse is consistent with traits of Orientalism, it is not the only Narnia fantasy novel to do this. Lewis, as I said before, does this again in further representations of the Kalorman, 
in the last battle. And Lewis writes, but when I found that we, we were to go in disguised as merchants, which is shameful dress for a warrior and a son of a Tarkhan, and to work by lies and trickery, then my joy departed from me. And most of all, when I found we must, we must upon a monkey, and when it began to be said that Tash and Aslan were one, then the world became dark in my eyes. How argues that in both texts the, Kal the Kalorman are portrayed as Middle Eastern, perhaps specifically as Turkish or Arab in their socio political power structures with harems, arranged marriages, and facial hair designating status? The style in which the author Lewis writes the build up to the Kalorman attack is, as Hal claims, reminiscent of the 9 11 terrorists in their, in their preparation for assaulting the World Trade Center and other targets. How compares the above encounter or the previous encounter with the prelude to 9-11 as afterwards the suspects were thought to be Arabic impersonating Westerners? Narnia's finale is consistent with not just Orientalism but also post 9-11 rhetoric on Islam connoting fear and distrust albeit the publication of The Last Battle being the same year as the Suez Crisis, it may not be surprising that the fever of the time found its way into Lewis's books. In the, um, Powell continues to write, in the wake of the attacks, the rhetoric employed by various American media outlets focused upon how the nation has been infiltrated by foreign operatives, at the point suspected to be Al-Qaeda and known to be Arabic, who had been trained specifically to dress and act like Westerners and in all ways blend into American culture. After the ringleader of the attacks, Muhammad Atta, had been identified, those who had conducted business with him expressed surprise that he was involved. One person who had, been, who had interacted with Atta shortly before 9-11 focused on his professional appearance, noting that he was nicely dressed, usually wearing a polo shirt, slacks and dress shoes. How could someone clearly, someone so clearly marked as Western do, th do something so terrible? And we know through colonialism that um, Westerners are very much capable of doing things um, terrible and awful. Stuart Hall um, tells us that post-colonialism forces people to revisit the binaries of colonial encounters. Colonialism interrupted childhoods as Windrush children were post-colonial citizens. What voice could win West Indian children hear themselves in the books of C.S. Lewis? And I myself identify with that term post-colonial citizen as a grandchild of the Windrush generation with my own childhood enveloped in the Narnia stories growing up in the noughties. Now I see how these books can manipulate childhood views of whiteness and really Englishness where being English was tied to being white. Anything else was other. In these texts, we see children in the void of innocence in imagined lands. Emma Up Richard argues that the becoming child is seen as an adult in the making, evident more so in quest stories pertinently Edmund, Edmund's development in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. At the beginning of this, of this talk, I said fantasy in the world of make-believe um, are staples of childhood. Childhood innocence, like childhood experiences, are socially constructed. However, in a society that functions on racism, Orientalism, denoted by Said in literature, makes the lives of black and brown children at school and society more widely that much harder. Westwood also claims that pre-adolescent children are social actors, that are always constructing their own childhoods. Yet when not all children begin life with the same privileges, does being and becoming, becoming even matter? When my own experiences of racism at school as young as five years old are not so different to the nature of the British school system today, what hope is there for today's children in the land of fantasy fiction and make-believe? No matter how much contemporary audiences try to rationalise the prejudices in children's books of 
the mid 20th century. These texts were, many of these texts were Orientalist and the epistemicide presented in them spilled into society. Furthermore, we cannot relegate Orientalism in children's fantasy as a problem that stayed in the last century. It is, an un, it is really an uncontested fact that Harry Potter is a global hit. However, it can also be argued that these texts are conditioned by the same imperialist discourses um, discussed by Ed, Edward Said in Orientalism, in his 1978 book, Orientalism. In the Harry Potter franchise, we see Rowling's begrudging acknowledgement of ethnic minorities through Lee Jordan, Dean Thomas, Dean Thomas, Cho Chang, and the Patils, namely Pavati, recycling um, certain inherited Orientalist stereotypes and new stereotypes born out of Britain's ongoing negotiation with a multicultural future, as said by Abin uh, Chakraborty. Um, now I would recommend just um, having a, a little break, stretch your legs and carry on, uh, or you can just carry on. And, and now I'm going to talk about Harry Potter for a little minute here. Our introduction to Nagini, Lord Voldemort's snake um, in the Goblet of Fire, is further scrutinised when we realise um, Nagini is the Sanskrit word for snake and is later on played by Korean actress Claudia Kim in prequel spin-off Fantastic Beast Crimes of Grindelwald. Here, not only does J.K. Rowling imply that she sees Asia as a homogenous whole, but also asserts the but also asserts the abiding relevance of post-colonial studies in the new millennium, where the aftershocks of colonial discourses continue to be felt to different discursive levels. The sequel showed how easily Hollywood sexualizes Asian women and by proxy disempowers um, young girls and women today. Claudia Kim's Nagini arrives after the historic sexualization of women in children's fantasy. The implementation of Nagini is deeply layered if you're familiar with the Potterverse or the, the Harry Potter stories, either the books or the films or, or, or both. We are introduced to Nagini as Lord Voldemort's pet snake and later on as the final Horcrux. We meet the snake for the first time, I believe, in the Goblet of Fire in Harry's dream, though we, though we find out later it is far from a dream and the snake is then beheaded by Neville Longbottom in Deathly Hallows at the, at the Battle of Hogwarts. Nagini's venom actually prevents wounds from healing, and we know the snake can be possessed by both Harry and Lord Voldemort, as they're both parcel mouths as well. Nagini almost killed Arthur Weasley. She killed Severus Snape and also Severus Snape, sorry, and also wore the outer skins of Bathilda Bagshot in Deathly Hallows in that really creepy scene in Godric Hollow. So it bears commenting. Um, why did J.K. Rowling cast an Asian woman in the role in the Fantastic Beasts sequel, Nagini as a puppet to a white master? To be more specific, she is named she is named as a maledictus, a form of a form of curse passed from mother to daughter that condemns a woman to become a beast and lose her humanity forever. As viewers, we know we know what happens to Nagini. She becomes the snake forever and then ends up in the hands of Lord Voldemort one of the evilest men in the history of the Wizarding World. She is then killed by another man, or boy, Neville Longbottom, when she is a Horcrux of Lord Voldemort, magically tethered to Voldemort's soul and thus in his possession. So as the only Asian character in the Fantastic Beasts sequel, she stands out in, in this lack of representation. She is sexualized and also possessed by this guiding white hand in the scene where she turns into the snake it is racist because many of us have seen these stereotypes playing out in numbers of ways before. The exotic, and I emphasize exotic in air quotes there, um, the exoticization of Asian women um, who are sexualized and fetishized by white men is a very real thing. Plus knowing that Nagini is, is a trapped, and I use trapped ten, um, in air quotes as well, Asian woman, that in the end, Lord Voldemort, another white man, kept as a pet.
and the sexualization of women um, in children's media texts did not start with Harry Potter. Um, Disney princess films have long been criticized for their portrayals of women as damsels in distresses with marriage as a reward as well. With Pocahontas, Disney also whitewashed a colonial genocide and in Princess and the Frog, the lead character, a black woman, spends most of the feature as an animal. Through an intersectional lens of fantasy, female leads are still unable to be depicted in every facet of their humanity. As late as 2018, Edward Said's ideas about othering show why Orientalism has a place in discourses about children's fantasy, especially in media texts and in a time where children from ethnic minority backgrounds are more likely to see animal characters than black and brown characters in children's literature that look like, that look like them. In films based on characters that J.K. Rowling created, the few black and brown people that are included have few lines between them and in some cases are victims of the same colonising imperatives of the last century. It is troubling to think that Orientalism still features in children's storytelling. If world famous authors and artists are continuing to other, to other cultures as their forebears did, what hope is there for black and brown children to feel empowered in represent, representation spaces today? Educator Darren Chetty taught in schools for almost 20 years that serve multiracial, multicultural and multi-faith communities. In his 2017 essay in The Good Immigrant, he talks about how children of colour still write stories that feature white children with anglophonic names who speak English as a first language. His findings speak to a society where whiteness in children's literature is still the default setting. Moreover, where children have implicit bias because of the stories they are exposed to. In 2020, Channel 4 aired a two-part documentary series entitled The School That Tried to End Racism that showed that children have an unconscious racial bias. Further to Channel 4's programme, Williams and Steele um, authored a 2017 paper showing in, show, that show in three separate studies children have implicit racial bias from a young age. Staples of children's literature set in worlds like, set in worlds like Narnia and Hogwarts cannot be solely to blame. However, we can argue that the void of critique on children's media texts as a source of prejudice or racism is as violent as the Orientalism itself. In Reading the Horse and His Boy, the intended young white audience are exposed to ch childhoods estranged from their own. They are immediately at a negative disposition to Arabis through the othering of Eastern women, written primarily as Shasta's opposite. And angry, and I emphasise angry, um, and I emphasise difficult, um, Kalorman, girl, escaping a forced marriage, a convention, a convention the author may believe as a cultural norm. C.S. Lewis um, writes that, and there's another thing I don't understand, so this is Shasta speaking here, and there's another thing I don't understand about the story. You're not grown up, I don't believe you're any older than I am, so talking to Aravis there. I don't believe you're as old. And now Brie um, interjects, Shasta, don't display your ignorance. They are always married at that age in the great Tarkhan families. Um, and here C.S. Lewis is showing his ignorance really and is uh, making a generalization here about the East, um, Eastern cultures. And he, he, does, he does it through um, um, the other wing of Aravis um, and the, the culture, the Kalorman culture that is meant that is meant to be as a stand-in for the East and um, predictably um, Islam. <coughs> as, as we've um, said already from early, earlier. And today we must also remember when black and brown women and girls are called difficult or angry, that comes with a set of connotations entrenched in racial violence and very much so in the context of black women and girls it plays into misogynoir so anti-black misogynistic racism we must be very careful 
when we call women of colour difficult or angry, when we also think about adultification bias and how black girls are treated as older than they are, we then see how to have childhood innocence is also part of white privilege, since black children are not afforded the privilege of childhood for forced to grow up, grow up before their time. As an enslaved boy, which why should Shasta know the ins and outs of Coloman political structures? In a way, he has held on to more of his innocence than Aravis has. Ignorant to the politics because of his class or lack of, due to his lack of, due to his lack of life experiences, experience at the start of the novel, characters like Shasta may be who, um, slave trader and philosopher John Locke was thinking about in his ideas about tabula rasa. In summary, referring to a, to a state in which a child is as formless as a blank. In the context of Aravis, this concept, concept fails since her intersectional experience as a Tarquina, so a noble woman, weaponizes her identity within the Kalorman political structure. Her gender identity is what Judith Butler may, uh, may label as consistent with gender performance. However, what Butler's theory does not cater for is the intersecting experiences, because the violence that many women experience is often shaped by other dimensions of their identities, such as race and class, as said by Professor Kimberly, Quench Kimberly Crenshaw. Butler is indicative of the failure, failures of of white feminism that historically excluded black and brown female voices, as said by Bell Hooks and also Rennie Edo Lodge and other, um, and other black um, writers and scholars. In The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, the white witch compliments Butler because the only identity in question is gender. Additionally, Gordon 2020 argues Turkish delight is a textual emblem synonymous with Eastern promise. The white witch uses this promise to tempt Edmund into betraying his siblings on the assurance he can eat Tarkus delight all day long. She is written as a temptress using orient oriental, and I use that term oriental in air quotes as well, um, oriental emblems to tempt the occident, Edmund. In a story mainly set in Narnia, Lewis introduces, introduces children to the villain by the use of sexualized uh, motifs. In the BBC series of 1988 and the film, uh, I think it was 2005, this interaction is presented as an adult ex exchange. So if you go to YouTube and watch these clips, so they should pop up on the screen um, um, now, you will see this as a very sexualized encounter. Look at the closeness between Edmund and the White Witch. In the 80s version, she even touched his face. And in the Disney version, um, they are remarkably close as well. And in both Turkish Delight, a, culin a culinary item is used to somewhat re represent that Turkish del Delight. So the, the, or the orientalness ishness of the term Turkish, connoted with the term Turkish, and then Delight um, seem to represent something good. And the association between the Orient and sex is remarkably persistent as written by Edward Said as well. Turkish delight is portrayed, uh, is portrayed as exotic and too much will degrade its allure. Sex interrupts concepts of childhood, innocence with its intrusion from the adult's cultural world. It interrupts the life of someone who is seen as a becoming child, embodying a deficit of skills universally linked to adulthood. Susan, on the other hand, commits the crime of growing up since she is no longer a friend of Narnia. She's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. And that's from the last battle. Susan's obsessions with lipstick and parties is an inclination of her leaving the asexual tropes of childhood and is punished for this in the last battle. It is not as if sexuality escapes her while she is in, she is in Narnia. With the magical world, however. In The Horse and His Boy, Susan and the Narnians are the guests of the Kalorman, where she is described as a possible match for Prince Rabadash. 
who King Edmund believes, and I quote, as a cruel and self-pleasing tyrant, it is telling that while Susan has the privilege to deny, to deny suitors, Aravis does not hold such privileges, further showing the delineation between Narnia, meaning Europe, and the eastern stand in Kalorman, writing Narnia as a place of democracy and Kalorman as a place of lawlessness, even for high-born women. However, while Susan desires Rapidash, Lewis makes a villain out of him and the Kalorman as the racial and religious other, what Said calls the Orient. Susan is essentially punished in the last battle for, her, for embracing her sexuality. In Lucy's dream, uh, Lucy punishes herself for not portraying conventional ideas of beauty. So this is her dream, or sort of her, pre what, what, her premonition of what could be um, in the Void of the Dawn Treader. Aslan is C.S. Lewis's manifestation of God, and this scene I feel is handled much better in the film than in the book, controversially. He calls her, he calls her child in a manner of speaking, he, and in a manner of speaking, he made her. Don't run from, your, from who you are. Um, and you'll find that um, scene um, come up on the screen as well, and click the link on the screen there. I find this scene really powerful. If it wasn't for Lucy, her brothers and sister would never have known Narnia. She was the first to, to discover it. It doesn't take much to realise why Lucy wants to be, to be like her older sister. Susan really embraced Western conceptions of beauty. Uh, while Susan went off to parties and, and whatnot, popular, uh, popular presumably gaining the, the attention of lots of lots of lots of male attention, and thus men telling her she's, telling her she's beautiful. Lucy was beautiful in other ways. Her spirit, most of all, as we see in the line the witch in the wardrobe, and again in Prince Caspian, when she goes in pursuit of Aslan. Lucy does not recognise her own beauty, and it really is subjective. If we are going to continue, if we are going to continue this theme of motifs and symbols, Susan could be likened to the pure English rose. Nice to look at, but withers under scrutiny and needs attention to maintain to maintain its beauty or allure. Lucy, on the other hand, on the other hand, like a sunflower, strong and resilient. Both are strong and beautiful in their own rights. However, Lucy's journey on, um, on self-esteem is highly relatable to many children, and I'm sure this is something we talk. This is something we talk about in. Re this is not, I'm not sure this is something we talk about talk about when reading these books. I think. I think she is quite a role model to not just young girls in society, but children in general are struggle with their self-esteem and confidence. When we look beyond the superficial surface of what denotes beauty and strength, there's lots to be said for Lucy Pevensey. Like the sunflower, Lucy brings light and, and further shows how we can find the strength to do what's required when the time permits it, and that beauty comes from within. A great lesson on insecurity, self-esteem and confidence in a film made, I think it's about 10 years ago now, adapted from a 50s novel. An improvement on the book, in my opinion, though I'm sure there will be many that disagree. And whilst there's so much in these texts to love, uh, you don't have to be a blue stocking of political correctness to find the horse and this boy in particular, anti-Arab or anti-Eastern or anti-Ottoman, as Kari O'Connor um, writes. However, they have um, arguments um, made by Said. Arguments made by Said about epistemic violence also needs to be had at a level of educational policy in schools. So in bids to decolonize a group called Hackney's Diverse Curriculum, Curriculum created a nine week lesson plan spread across early years to A-level aimed to further the teaching of black history in Hackney and the UK. However, they homogenized diversity with decolonial thought and as it aims to address diversity, it fails to analyse the entrenched epistemes of empire, race and colonialism. Whilst I've used this time so far to discuss Orientalism in the Narnia books and other works, Orientalism can also be applied to the role of black people as objects in other children's texts, such as, Enid, such as Noddy by Enid Blyton, 
all the all the othering of black people in uh, in other texts as well. Um, so Nadi by Enid Blyton and also Tintin in the Congo by Hargo, and be applied um, in schools to help teachers discuss race and othering in children's in children's media texts. 20th century oriental discourses in fantasy are also present in contemporary literature. In the late 20th century, Edward Said was discussing cultural imperialism in art, something still relevant to children's stories today. The underpinning epistemology, epistemologies should be an essential part of how educators and teachers discuss national education changes as decolonization as Professor Kaminda Bamba and colleagues say, is a way of thinking about the world, which takes colonialism, empire and racism as its, as its empirical objects, as its empirical and discursive objects of study. It resituates these phenomena as key shaping forces of the contemporary world in a context where their role has been systematically effaced from view. It purports to offer alternative ways of thinking about the world, and alternative forms of political praxis. While Syed's Orientalism is seen as a benchmark of post-colonial theory, it wasn't as inclusive as it could have been at the time he wrote it, I think. I acknowledge that it may sound like what about me, to, mo to not put too fine a point on it, however limited to the intersecting diasporas of the East and Islam, Orientalism could have gone on to include other cultures that suffered the epistemicide wrought by white British colonial rule or white European colonial rule um, for that matter. British children's literature, including the fantasy story, so the capital F and the capital S, rose to prominence uncoincidentally with the British Empire and thus saw its way into bookshops and households throughout the world. This empire stretched multiple continents across variations of cultures and skin tones, including white minorities or white people, including white people in Ireland. The common tropes of these stories were that they were very white, English and middle class, from Lewis Carroll and Ina Blyton to C.S. Lewis, Charles Kingsley and Elsa Marston and Francis Hodgson Barnett. As children are set to inherit this post-Brexit nation, in the thick of a public health crisis and the biggest anti-racist movement in, the his in history, there are forces out there still living in C.S. Lewis's land of spare oom and wardrobe. These literary texts, these literary texts, pertinently 20th century children's fantasy, have become part of the English landscape. As whiteness and middle classness is put on a pedestal, black and brown children will grow to believe that their places in these stories will not exceed that of the hired help or a supporting character with a few lines between them and worse to be excluded altogether in the in the 2020 adaptation of the secret garden based on the novel by francis hodgson barnett the film skips over the racist undertones of the source material in the choice to cast black actors in the lead roles and also in Mary, telling the children's stories. This follows modern, modern tropes of more diversity in film, but also multiculturalism, glossing over Barnett's disdain for India, a place she never, she never actually visited. In these ideas, Britishness connotes rural whiteness. It excludes today's black and brown children from engaging with some aspects of Britishness, an, an identity that in the mid 20th century would only have been given to white children through literature, like, when, like Winnie the Pooh um, and the Railway Children. The Orientalism in the Chronicles of Narnia books is a childhood situated in England's white and pleasant land, indeed, entrenched into the countryside. A morality reflected in Narnia itself, contrasted with Kalorman as something, something other or different. J.R.R. Tolkien's Lewis's contemporary depicts these concepts of innocence in Lord of the Rings, um, The Two Towers, when um, Aragorn, Gimli and Legolas are pursuing Pippin and Merry. In conversation with Aema, Aragorn calls the hobbits small, only children to your eyes. 
When the hobbits leave the Shire, they lose their innocence and that countryside bliss. This contrast with the problematized areas of Middle Earth, like Isengard and Mordor, and non-hobbit peoples at the Shire's borders. At the Shire's borders. The definitions of Englishness built into the landscape of children's literature places black and brown childhoods into urban areas. It tells children not born into the comfort of white privilege that the countryside is not for them. Darren Chetty and Karen Sands O'Connor say that locking BAME characters into urban settings also means certain kinds of Englishness are denied them, since many of the classic or canonical 20th century stories depend on the British countryside for freedom and ultimately safe adventures for white children. So white child characters and readers. The countryside in, Brit in, Brit in British children's books is a green and pleasant land indeed, but, but only if you are white or accompanied by someone white. In the context of the 21st century, for us in 2021, this reality can be articulated in one question that every black or brown person gets asked or will be asked. Sometimes every day, every week, let's just say we get asked it on a regular basis. It's the question that must be asked before the conversation can continue. Where are you from? Four words that often place British born people of colour outside of a legitimate British identity. When the person asking that question is white, the underpinning ideas in this question, whether intentional or not, is racist because it comes after a history where Britishness was constructed as a racial identity and that identity was white. A better framing of that question is what's your heritage? But British is a, is a nationality. If a white person asks, where are you from? It is different than when a person asking that question is not white. When my black friends and colleagues ask me that question, I know it comes from a place of solidarity somewhat, but when a white person asks this, it can often come from a place of well-intentioned curiousness, as um, Afua Hirsch states in her book British, but that curiousness is what led to ideas of patriarchy, which essentially means in order to be British, one must be racialized as white. And these concepts of patriarchy are entrenched in 20th century children's books just as they are entrenched in the heads of the statesmen of the last 20 of the last century who set the mechanics for things like the Windrush scandal. For people like me that went to school in Britain's countryside, this green and pleasant land and identifies with the country more than the town or the city. Someone that played cricket and pl still plays cricket, my relationship with Britishness is more is in common is more in common with lots of those white characters um, in, in, in Enid Blyton's books, for example, like The Famous Five or the, the Faraway Tree and so on, or the characters in The Railway Children by E. Nesbitt, then say characters such as the cast of the BAFTA, of the BAFTA winning film, um, Netflix film Rocks, or even British TV series Top Boy and the West Midlands set Blue Story, or even London set Small Axe. It strikes me to it strikes me to contemplate that even when I'm watching black British stories in the 21st century, lauded for their representation, I will struggle to identify with these depictions, not only because I was privately educated, but also as I grew up, grew up and still live outside of this country's major cities. As much as I enjoy visiting Birmingham, Liverpool, Edinburgh, not so much London. In those places, I'm a foreigner, but I know when I go to visit my colleagues in Stroud in Gloucestershire, as I hope to do um, this year in the summer, I will feel at home in the country. When I visit my colleagues in Buckingham, that is also home. When I visit um, my friends in Ashton, which is a village in Northamptonshire by road, that is also home. My Britishness is not big red buses and black cabs and the big smokes of London or Manchester. It is cricket and pastoral English country greens.
but I'm not quite Downton Abbey or The Crown draped in the Union Jack, but one of my favourite favorite books of all time, and films of all time, is The Railway, is the Railway Children, and the 1970 film of the same name with Bernard Cribbins. Someone who grew up going camping in Suffolk and walking through the musty airs of Brixworth Country Park, so much black Britishness features a racial identity limited to Britain's cities. What about Britain's black populations that are, that are in places like that are in areas like Bedford or Milton Keynes, for example, etc., etc.? Even those places are relatively urban. But for me, who spent his early educational life going to school in the country, watching black childhoods in towns and cities is breaking new ground. It's as interesting as it is frightening how I don't quite identify with characters who look just like me because things like geography matter, especially when my opinions on the countryside are completely opposite to my black friends who grew up in the city. However, back in the 60s and 70s, the way these stories were, ex these stories excluded uh, people of colour, like West Indian children of Windrush in the mid to late 20th century, these depictions were tied with other external factors like, like prejudice and racism and had real consequences as we as articulated in the 1985 um, Swan Report. In the 60s and 70s, Grenadian politician and author Bernard Cord states that West Indian children were placed in schools for the, designed for the education of subnormal, so ESNs, because of teachers' biases in assessments, um, including that of culture and class. In his seminal pamphlet, he goes on to discuss the damaging nature of only teaching a white middle class curriculum, curriculum and recommends that black children should also be learning about black culture and history. In the finale of Steve McQueen's Small, Small Axe film anthology, um, and that finale um, entitled Education, audiences are witness to the backstories of the ESNs and how they were a catalyst for black supplementary school movement across Britain, so black children could embody all parts of their humanity and identity. Where the horse and his boy has been criticised for its ethnocentric representations, its reach is far wider since the Chronicles of Narnia is a household name. What Edward Said denoted as Orientalism amongst Far Eastern cultures in the Middle East, Asia and North Africa, the same poisonous racist views through art are also pointed to various cultures in the non-Islamic Black Atlantic. In the years Said was thinking and writing in the US, Britain saw activist movement across society um, in every sense saying black children matter. As these books are so thought of as childhood nostalgia, even by me, it cannot be ignored that these texts may also be counterintuitive to children's development as social actors when interacting with children, with children groups that are, that are of higher risk of racism. So black and brown children and children from non, basically essentially non-English cultures. Whilst Narnia exists for all its wonders and prejudices, specifically black and brown children today are still more likely to see animal characters like the lion Aslan in texts in text, and characters like the, the, in, then characters that look like them. With media texts also including films that centre talking animal protagonists, this reinforces the timeless appeal of Narnia and that is, is as frightening as it is interesting. Thank you very much. And if anyone's got questions or wants to talk about anything, we've got quite, we've got, we've got some time if anyone's got anything they want to say. Anyone got any questions or anything? Trey, I think Sarah's got her hand up. Okay, yeah. Um, ask away. 
Okay, thanks. That was really interesting. I did grow up on a lot of those stories myself. And I've really appreciated like getting a different uh, lens on it than I'd really pushed myself to do. Um, I've been thinking while you were speaking, like, would it be good to actually just find new stories? Like, do we need to look at these stories, but put on a new lens? Or do we need to just start putting new stories into the schools and into um, our children's book list? I'm, I ask, why not both? Okay, <laughs> I, yeah. I think um, a lot of those old canonical texts have a lot going for them. I think a lot of them are really well written. Um, one of my okay. favorites, one of my favorites, and I did this at GCSE, was Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. And I know my, my whole class hated it, but I, I liked it. Um, mm. But then doing this master's that I'm doing now with um, and Sabo and Shabnam who are on this call as well, um, the race, education, and decolonial thought masters at Leeds Beckett, when you put a raced lens on books like Wuthering Heights, it completely changed how I would read Heathcliff. Um, because um, in some cases, some people have said he is a, a black character um, or a mixed race black mixed race character. In other cases, yeah. I've, I've seen him be seen as he's actually written as a gypsy. Bronte calls him a gypsy in, in that text. Um, so if we taught Wuthering Heights through a racialized lens, um, we we could then tie how black people may have been seen in the Victorian period, because we know there were black Victorians in Britain at the time. Especially, especially in Liverpool, um, but also in that time, um, what, what, what were Irish travellers doing during that time and, and people who are part of the Gypsy ethnic group at that time as well. So I think if we taught Wuthering Heights through an through ethnicised lens or racialised lens as well, it would put a whole different take on that book. It might be, it might be a, le a bit less boring for people who are being taught it at, at the same time. And yes, I do agree as well that we need more books by people that are writing today as well. So, and you can you can compare and contrast them as well at the same time. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Anyone else got questions or comments or anything that they want they want to share? Um, I think Shabnam's got her hand up. Yeah, Shabnam. I have. I have. I just wanted to follow on from what Sarah was saying, or kind of like respond to her actually. Um, because, yeah, I'm um, studying the MA with, with Sabo and with Trey, but I also um, lecture on the um, teach training undergraduate courses at um, Leeds Beckett. Um, and certainly kind of, you know, students on the primary courses, um, I don't do the secondary ones, but, um, you know, they're being asked to challenge this kind of um, the literary canon, you know, and, and look at... Um, the classics because I think I agree with Trey I think that some of them have got a lot to offer and they are well written you know you, you can get a lot of poetry through it and I think that it's important to continue to acknowledge them but it is important to look at them through this racialized lens I think that that's the key thing is to address those aspects that people may not have actually thought about before well certainly a lot of people will not have thought about before um and children will not have been uh introduced to either and i think that's the key thing you know if when we talk about sort of decolonizing the curriculum and decolonizing everything um i mean it's a bit of a buzzword isn't it but but this is what it really is it's about questioning and it's about um asking those questions, not sort of, you know, discounting things, not discounting curricula, not discounting text, not discounting art or history, but using it to really question and sort of, you know, um, make reparations actually through people being able to ask questions and having those real answers. Um, but having said that, again, going on just from what Trey was saying, yes, I think that new texts are always important. And one of the things that um, one of the um, projects that, that, that comes out of Leeds Beckett is called Storymakers. And that project certainly um, encourages children to be the author of their own texts mm -hmm. and to create narratives that involve them 
and have their, you know, sort of has actual representation. So I just wanted to add that to what Sarah was saying. Yeah, <laughs> that was really good to have them. I think I want to add as well that um, more recently, period dramas or UK made period dramas, depending on who's helming it, are doing more for diversity. And I think when you when you sort of look at what dramas are being made, and then compare and sort of compare them with the canon, and sort of use those dramas to inform your practice in terms of critiquing the canon, I think that can be really useful. So for one example I would use would be the recent adaptation of William Thackeray's um, Fantasy Fair. Um, and that was done by ITV. It was, just, it was on ITV, but it was made by a company called Mammoth Screen. Um, Mammoth Screen also produced Poldark, um, which was also quite a controversial show in terms of its depiction of gender, but also of race. But Vanity Fair in particular um, has a Barbadian um, character in it, and she's the richest character in the show. And the racial politics of that in, in Victorian England at the time, it, when you watch it, it upsets a lot of people. Um, and I think that to show students that, that'll be interesting to watch because there were, at the time of that, at the time that set in, black people in, in Britain who, who had money as well. Um, and one of the most um, well-known examples of that would be the um, Georgian, the Georgian era. So a bit, a bit later, a bit earlier, sorry, um, Georgian heiress Dido, um, Dido Bell, <clears throat> um, who lived in Kenwood, Kenwood House, which is in London, and her uncle was Lord Mansfield, who was one. He was the most powerful man in England at the time, and ruled on two of the most important slave trade cases. So one, one of them was the Zon case. Um, and the other one was the Somerset case as well. Um, I think they were in the same decade. So I think when it comes to looking at canon, look at what period dramas are out there and being made and w which ones are breaking convention. Um, Vanity Fair was one of them. Um, Paul Duck is another one in terms of gender, but also the last season had um, a black female character in it. Um, and her husband, was an abolitionist campaign as she was as well. So, and that upset a lot of people too, because it wasn't historically accurate, but it was, because that was based on a real person. So that also upset them that they didn't know their history properly. Um, um, Paul Dark, uh, Vanity Fair, Sanderton, based on the unfinished Jane Austen novel. Um, you had uh, a black character in, in that too. Um, Les Miserables, which is, I'm not sure if Les Mis is canon, but the, um, the BBC adaptation had a mixed race cast and that, ups that really upset the ap apple cart in terms of period drama. So I'll look at that one too. Um, the actor David Oyelowo, who's quite big in Hollywood, he plays Javert. Um, and you had, you, had an, you had an Indian guy playing um, um, Monsieur Tenandier and his, and, his, and his children were, mi were mixed race as well. And that's, that's set in France during the 19th century. Um, but yeah, there's quite a lot of period dramas out there that are really doing really good things in terms of diversity. And you can sort of con compare and contrast that to the canon. And that, I think that's how I'd go about it. And perhaps when students see that, they might be more um, willing to go now and do their own research on this stuff because there's, there's quite a lot of period dramas that are being made um, that are breaking convention and, and, and upsetting people. And that's, and, that's the way, and that's the way to go. <laughs> that's the way to go, really. But yeah. Uh, anyone else got any questions or comments or anything? Uh, I think Claire's got her hand up. Um, Claire. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you so much, Trey. It was really, really, really um, interesting presentation. Um, I've been listening along with my, my son, actually, who's nine. Yeah. And you've caused a bit of a debate. He, we, I mean, I, live, I read all the Narnia books when I was a kid, and he's been reading them um yeah so you've you've asked us some important made us ask some important questions so is it, if it's all right he just wants to ask you a very quick question which actually is um kind of like similar to some of the questions in the chat so if that's all right i'll just let him ask his question um okay it's just, um, it's just can you hear him can you name the children's story which is equal say a bit louder sweetie it's just can you name a children's story which is equal, equal. 
Mm. Um, which story which which could be representative? I think he means. I would say you're safe if you read anything by Mallory Blackman. I have been read like she's been writing. She's been doing diversity in children's books for nearly twenty years, and I don't think I would be as obsessed with literature if it wasn't for Mallory Blackman. Um, and I'll probably start with books like Hacker and Pick Heart Boy. Um, but my favourite is Boys Don't Cry. Um, and I think that's probably one of the best books I've ever written. So I'll say go and look at Mallory, Mallory Blackman books. Um, and I think that's quite, that's, quite, that's quite equal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Say thank you a lot. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've got another suggestion where you can find more diverse like literature. It's um, Mirami Wright. If you find her on um, Twitter, she's got like, because she sells books. So she basically has like a very diverse range of books that she does sell. So if you're not too sure, she'll always give you a recommendation of like a more diverse version of Narnia, for example, or Lion, the Witch in the Wardrobe. I'm a high school teacher, so unfortunately I can't really take advantage of that. But Mirror Me Right is my recommendation. Um, Thank you. Rory. Um, also, Trey, someone called Elizabeth has got their hand up. Hi, uh, how you doing? Hi. How are you keeping? Um, really good talk. So interesting. Um, I was just wondering about the idea of, so I'd raised kind of by that question about, you know, books that are, are equal. Um, issue books are kind of, you know, something that's that's really, really common, obviously, within the whole YA space. Um, you know, it's always the issue of bullying or the issue of the other or issue of, um, you mm. know, eating disorder, issue, issue, issue. Um, are we a bit in danger, I suppose? I think, like, in, in the education space, there might be a tendency to go, oh, I want to teach them about this issue. I'm going to get this issue book. Um, and that's what we're going to look at. Mm. Um, then what's happening is instead of, uh, there was a lovely quote from uh, the American Librarian Association's um, address last year, I think it was, and it was about that our aim should be uh, to select and honour in our kind of curation of, of, of literature uh, and normalise the everyday experience of the wide and diverse kind of um, range of humans that's out there you know that, that that's a bad paraphrase of it it was more eloquent than that but um that really that's what our intent should be when we're selecting text mm. yeah i definitely agree there because i think by making it an issue we're not addressing the issue as well because it's all it's sort of i think in, in a, and until we start taking books that sort of embed them and, that, and those things don't become single things to, to single out I think I don't think we'll, we'll progress like I think in order when we choose literature that I think this term in, intersectionality does play a role in how we, it's, not, it's not just about social markers but also how bullying can overlap with so many different things bullying overlaps with racism sexism and, and social justice, social justice issues um, and, and so forth um, and I think I don't think until we start thinking like that, that even as I'm talking to you now and doing this talk, and on the surface, most people would racialize me as black, but they would not necessarily know that I'm also um, on the autism spectrum as well, because that that pe people can't you can't see that straight away. Um, so I think when it comes to choosing books and what books gets put on the curriculum, that intersectional thinking needs to come into that. Uh, it's not just a book about black women, it's a book about black women that are disabled, the working class, etc. etc. Um, and I think I think that's what you were alluding to there. Yeah. That, yeah. A little bit, yeah, I'm I'm kind of alluding to the idea that, like mm. say that 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 example of a book that you gave there, that the book should have that character in it, but that the the story isn't about the fact that that character is black, yeah. disabled, etc. Et yeah. The story is about the everyday lived experience of uh, yeah. or the story is about you know the narrative has some something yeah. at, but it's not like this is you let's put it front and center and forget about the broader context of society and things that this sits in and, and that kind of thing that sometimes happens where uh the other things get overshadowed and it's reduced yeah. it's very reductive very simplification simplified in terms of what we're really trying to get students to maybe be aware of in in the real lived world i suppose 
I know where I'm going. <laughs> I mean, Mallory Blackman, um, the, well, my favourite one by her, Boys Don't Cry, I think it, it, it starts to do that quite well because it's a, it's a, this, the main character is called Dante um, and he's doing his A-levels and um, one day uh, a girl turns up at his door, a former girlfriend with a, with a baby and now you're, now you're 18 and, uh, and a father essentially and it deals with teenage, teenage pregnancy and teenage fatherhood um, in the UK um, in, the, in, in the 2000s and it's not until you get to the end of the book that Manny Blackman subtly and quite cleverly tells us that that character is black um, and in, in doing that she provokes us to talk about colour blindness in literature and how when the character is not when their race is not um, said, we assume that character to be white. And in, I think that's really interesting in, in the way she did that. So I think, and in Mary Blackman books, I think she, she does that quite a lot, to be, to be honest, um, with, the exception of, with the exception of Noughts and Crosses, because that's quite heavily racial, um, entrenched in racial politics and, 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 so, and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, yeah, I understand what you're saying there. Like we need, we need just, good stories, not stories about a certain thing, that's a certain issue. Stories that include those things, but don't make a, um, a thing out of it. I think that's, I think that's what you're, you're alluding to. Um, Becky, Adam, did you have a question? Hello, yes. Hi. You're right. Um, thank you, that was a brilliant talk, as always. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I was just kind of, I didn't really know how to word my question very um, clearly, but I was kind of thinking about how when I when I teach English at a secondary level, all of the stuff that you were kind of talk about, I'm really happy to do in a context situation, maybe because I'm also, um, uh, I've done history to quite a high level, so I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, but but pre kind of A-level age, I, I'm a little bit more nervous about um, like lit crit, like looking at it through a post-colonial literary criticism lens. And I just wonder what you thought about the balance between those um, or, or how to marry them or how they work together or whether there even is a kind of line between them. Um, I think when it comes to looking at colonialism pre-secondary, I think a lot of people do have a a, a hesitancy because these are children in their, in their formative years of development and childhood and you don't want you don't want to skew their thinking to a certain way if they don't think like that already but at the same time um i can tell you that when i was at that age so i'm talking about six seven eight um years old i knew what colonialism was um because i had to know um and I think to not teach children at that age what colonialism is and post, well not necessarily post colonialism, but at least know what colonization is and how, how Britain got to where it was to, to a degree that is white privilege to, to not have to, to not have to know. Um, cause I know a lot of my colleagues who I came up with, black colleagues and um, colleagues with, from, um, South Asian backgrounds as well. They were my South Asian, my South Asian friends were being told by their grandparents and how they survived partition, partition of India, because um, they had to know, because that, that was part of their lives. So I think when it comes to children, young people, and I think it, by all means, I think they should need to be taught it, but how we teach them it could, the medium could, it needs to change how, that needs to change. It doesn't have to be being lectured for hours on it. It, it can be in a different way. So one of the books that I really found useful in teaching children about, about race was um, uh, is there's um, there's My Hair by Hannah Lee. Um, if anyone's seen that book, oh, it's, yeah. it's a picture book, children's book, um, and it really gets black children like feeling good about their hair, especially in this society where schools are saying you can't have afro hair or dreadlocks because it's not it's not professional and that and that sort of thing um and also the book soul way it's by the actor lupita nyong'o um and it talks about colorism and, and i think that we're really that's quite useful in getting children to engage it's a it's really accessible 
I bought it for myself because I liked <laughs> I like I like children's books in general just because of how accessible they are. Um, so I think when it comes to race, those two books are quite useful, but there are there are others as well. Um, and colonialism, um, I can't recommend um, horrible histories enough. To be on to be honest, um, I think they're quite useful for people to engage. Um, then there's David Olasoga's Black and British book. He released a children's edition last year, I believe. Um, and that is also really useful. Um, what else is there? Uh, I found, I think his documentaries will probably be accessible as well. The, the Black and British documentaries. Because my brother watched them and he's, he's 13. And I know some of his younger colleagues watched them. So they're like 10, 11 years old and they, they watched them too and found them quite, they're quite useful to engage with. So when it, I think when it comes to resources and skills and whatever, and when it comes to decolonial approaches to that, um, don't rely on books. But books aren't everything. Like, I, like, I like reading, but there are more resources out there than books. And, and in university context, books and journal articles. Um, in a lot of my essays, I've used YouTube videos, um, documentaries, um, conversations with colleagues of reference conversations as well um and podcast episodes or something yeah podcast i think that was the there was the 1619 one the american one that was that was quite useful and there was afro Hirsch's podcast on the british empire which is quite useful as well um but yeah when it comes to decolonial thought it i think it comes to thinking what 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 sources do we put we put about above others about above others and which sources are seen as valuable, and which sources do we say that aren't, aren't a proper source, or a proper source, or whatever that means. Um, yeah, I think all sources are valuable. Um, and I think my last essay that I did was on autism and policing. Um, and I did talk about the Holocaust in, in that, in terms of the history of autism. And then I referenced um, Judge Robert Winder's episode of Who Do You Think You Are? And that, and that is a source, and that is a, that to me that is ethnography. That's auto ethnography, but it's it's done in a way that's accessible to people. Um, so I think when it comes to colonialism, children, documentaries are quite useful. But choose which type of documentary you use. Don't give them Jamie Paxman, <laughs> like because um, he's quite he's quite a um, he's quite in your face, even for a documentary. But David Olasoga is quite accessible. I think for, for young people and children, but yeah, if that if that answers um, your question, but yeah, what what do we value as a source? What isn't a source? And that's epistemology in a nutshell, um, and epistemic violence. And in saying some sources are not sources, that is that is violence essentially, because you're putting you're putting one form of knowledge above another form of knowledge. So yeah. Trey, can I jump in on that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. English teacher so I had to like just kind of slip in there um I think <laughs> I think I think the best thing that we can do especially because it's not written in the cur uh, curriculum map anywhere like even context isn't really written on the map it it's what how how well read we are on the matter how much we know about uh, colonialism how much we know and are comfortable with talking about it as well and I think just the way that you talk about it and about literature in tandem like there's a lot to be said there I think there's a lot of stuff that I do within my lessons where they the value is more on the fact that they get that information but it's not in an explicit way it's in a very nuanced way through the course of the lesson and in the end they're like wait mm. I think I know what you're trying to talk about and I'm just like you know I make them think that they're Edward Said creating Orientalism for the first time <laughs> But I think there's a huge value in that. I think sometimes being bogged down with terminology, being bogged down with critical lenses mm. is actually a little bit harmful for kids. Uh, well, in, in a, a, like in school, I don't mean kids. I don't want to be derogatory. I, I learn more from them than they learn from me. But I do think, I think there's a, there's a value in the way that we talk and that teach talk really has that um, value in it. Um, and the way that I teach is very... Um, 
they're just pictures on the board so they really do have to take what I'm saying as uh, not gospel but really listen to what I'm saying and really sit with that and I think I try to make sure that is before every task as well like if I'm mentioning something about um partition for example I'll make sure it's just before the task that they need to do it so that mm -hmm. link is going to be way more explicit in the work that they're going to do immediately after it but yeah I, d I definitely hear you out on that trouble of like context and in so many ways we teach knots and cro crosses and I was just like I need to tell them about colonialism I need to tell them about the transatlantic trade mm -hmm. and, and you can't you can't you, you physically can't because there's no time but mm -hmm. Um, I, I mix that in with homework projects. I mean, I just make sure I go a little bit off the scheme. Um, I make sure they're still learning the key things, but um, it's finding my way of doing it within and outside the classroom and knowing that I'm not just giving them Google and saying, go ahead and do it by yourself. Um, these are the things that we're kind of going to be touching on. Ask your parents, do they know anything about this thing? Uh, ask this person, ask that person. But of course that works on depending on... Um, what kind of um group that you teach as well but yeah yeah um in terms of source in terms of sources as well i would say um poetry books i can't recommend them enough to be honest but yeah using poetry as a source it's ac people academic snobs will get will get all uptight about it but there's certain books like um portal paradise Bodger robinson um I would actually go as far to say it's a, it's a black history book, but it's a poetry book as well. Um, Holly McNish is another poet, poet that I really like. Um, and I know that on, in poetry, I know English teachers do a lot. On, they, do world, they do war poetry. Um, and Holly McNish wrote a poem called The War's Whores. And it's about sex work during World War I. Um, and it's on YouTube. You can find it. It's really good. And so those sorts of poems, I think, would get people involved and also poets poetry by acts that are not necessarily published so performance acts i know some of you came to the last canny poet event we did on white supremacy and those sorts of acts that are not published but do perform a lot and do a lot around the country like spoken word poetry is really useful and getting students involved um in poetry because they spoken word artists just say it how it is a lot of the time and they don't they don't hide really hide behind form and line breaks and metaphors and that, and that sort of thing. So um, I think poetry is quite useful for that, especially empire poetry. Spoken word is political. You'll find, you'll, you won't have to look very hard to find poetry about colonialism. Um, so so yeah. Um, anyone else got any more questions or comments or anything? Um, Trey, I think um, Revolt Poet has their hand up. Yeah, Ashley, go ahead. Um, um, thought it was great. Cheers for that. I'm maybe being slightly contrarian with this question. So I'll mm -hmm. preface that. Um, you'd expect nothing less. Um, in terms of the 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 Orientalism and the stereotyping of the of the colour men, you covered that quite well. Mm -hmm. Do you think then the most useful way of using this from a from a lit critique angle is to say in the context of racial antagonism both ways or just from a Western gaze? And the reason I say that, of course, is Alamon are quite disparaging about the natural inhabitants of Narnia, referring to them as barbarians. And mm. of course, there's the whole kind of Ottoman Western clash. So mm. do you think it's a case of actually this is something we could use to speak, obviously to contextualize in terms of Western gaze, but also actually to almost contextualize the East-West dispute and the dispute, if you want, of the sort of war of empires rather than just it being yeah, kind of I think, colonial? I think that's reasonable, but because British Empire wasn't the only empire, and white supremacy is not the only supremacy system, um, as well. Um, however, I, I, I think in terms of in this context and the global northern context, it would be useful to learn how different empires operated, because I don't think the British Empire and the French Empire necessarily operated on on the same. But even though they were the views were sort of aligned and. Uh, in schools and whatever, do students learn about French colonialism in Africa, for, ex for example? Because um, I think when it comes to decolonizing the curriculum, there's a lot of there's a lot of thought about what about teaching the British Empire and putting that on the curriculum. What, but what about what did France do exactly? And, and what did Spain do? Spain were in it as well, and Germany and the Netherlands were in it. 
as well. I so think this is, I think this is pro- probably striking mm. to the heart of the question, and I'm mm. intrigued to see what you think. Because obviously, when we talk about decon- decolonization of of the curriculum, primarily we're talking about sort of from Western eyes, and as you say, a British Empire mm. context. Mm. Is it actually therefore that you think we need a, a more balanced depiction of all colonization before we can sort of decolonize, if you know what I mean? Add the layers in to take it away. Is that sort of what you would advocate? For? Um, I think you've got to, I think, yeah, it's sort of, I think you have to really, because otherwise you're, you're in a sort of fight with one, with, that, with one arm behind your back, with your eyes closed a little bit there. Um, and like take the slave trade, for example. So whilst we have the triangular trade, on the east coast of Africa, you also had um, you also had Arabic slave traders coming in to, to Mozambique as well and taking black people from there at the same time that the white people were taking black people from West Africa. Um, so I think when it comes to teaching colonialism, it, it, I think it would be useful to teach all of, to teach all of it and, and see what we get get from that. Um, but yeah, I think I think that sort of answered answered your question. But yeah, I think it, I think it goes back to what Saba was saying earlier as well about teachers knowing the history too, and from a literary critique point of view, when it comes to these texts, there's a lot that you'll get outside of just reading literary criticism. Um, most of the books that I've most of the books I used in the last session, so that was on canon, um, were sociology books and history books. I only used one book that was literary criticism, and that was a criticism of the book um, Why Does the Gas OC by Jean Rees. Um, but yeah, I think teachers in general, that it goes back to what Shabnam was saying as well about teacher training, but also um, teachers doing the reading and then applying that reading to the text that they have to teach in schools. Um, because there's a lot to be said about the hist- historical context of these books, but also the social context, sociolog- sociological context of these books too. So uh, applying the, the social sciences, it has to be multidisciplinary. Basically. That's, what, that's what I'm trying to say. You can't teach English literature just from an English literature perspective because it, it affects everyone. It's, it's, anything that involves people um, has a so- can have a social sciences, can have a historical perspective to it. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Any any uh, any further questions? Um, I just want to add to that, Trey. That was first of all well said. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> um, I think step one needs to happen when it comes to decolonizing anything. We need to learn it from st- like the start. We don't even really know enslavement properly the way it properly happened. And only in doing the masters did I really learn that actually everything that I learned in school was nothing and maybe that's down to my memory as well because I didn't really retain much from school either but all I took from it was the picture of the ship and and how tightly packed it was we were never told about how they were people how they were ripped away from their families and stuff like that and I think yeah I think step one needs to happen before we get into the more um the wider conversation we need to hit the basics before we (laughs) take it one step further definitely yeah, and I think as well in terms of decolonization, there needs to be some, uh, even when we have anti-racism discussions and the ones I've seen on, on TV and whatever, there's very little historical analysis there. Um, and the only people I see talking about it historically are um, Professor Kendi Andrews at Birmingham City and Afro Hirsch, um, the um, journalist and academic, um, really. But then when it comes to anti-racism, we've got to look at the history of racism in the UK, in a UK context, which is very different to the US context. And I find people conflate that. Um, and in doing that, then you have to look at how race was made because it doesn't actually ex- exist. Um, and one of the books I'd recommend for that would be, um, there's Superior, um, The Return of Race Science by Angela Siney. Um, and she's a science journalist. Um, so, to, so when you said about enslavement and not learning that properly, before you can actually talk about enslavement, you've got to look at how the establishment um, demonized, demonized the black race, essentially. Um, because you have, to, you have to look at how they turned, a whole, turned people against black people and how they did it through science, tentatively in air, in air, in air quotes. Um, 
And then once you once you understand how that science operated, then you can start learning about the triangular trade and and all, and all that sort of stuff. But there's so much stuff before we even think about the transport of enslaved people from Africa that happened. And yeah, it's all in the academics and the, and the universities at the centre of it. They justified all of it through academia, and it's, it, it's, it's all horrible. But yeah, you've got you've got to learn you've got to learn that stuff before I think you can sort of talk about how enslavement was a horrible thing and morally morally disgusting. And yeah, um, any more any more questions? Any more comments? Any more at your end, so have you seen anyone with their hands up? Um, nope. Uh, I am going to stop the recording now, though. Okay.